We're good. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. It is um, Thursday, January 13th. It's 10 o'clock and we are meeting in council chambers at City Hall. I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order and acknowledge that the press and the public have been duly notified of this meeting in accordance with FOIA. The first order of business will be the election of a chair and vice chair. And I'll go ahead and accept any nominations for the office of chair. I, given that Mr. Street or Councilman's treatment is a senior member of the committee, I would nominate him. Great. Street, council member Streetman is nominated. Is there a second? A second. All right, seconded. Any discussion or any other nominations? Uh, I would nominate Jan Anderson. Is there a second? There being none. Oh. Can I second myself? Sure. Okay, I second that. So All right. Two choices. We have two nominations. Any discussion before we go out of the, uh, have a vote? All right. We'll go and have a vote on the first nomination, which is for council member treatment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Aye. All right. <laughs> that nomination fails. Um, now a vote on the second nomination, which is council member Anderson for the office of chair. All those in favor, um, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, unanimous, no, nobody opposed. Chair Anderson, I will hand it over to you for nominations uh, to the office of vice chair. Well, thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to serving. Um, I guess the first order of business is the approval of previous well, minutes. Vice chair. Oh, yeah. we need to pick vice chair first? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, do we have a nomination for a vice chair? I'd like to nominate Rusty. Second. Streetman. You can go ahead with a vote. Okay. Do we have a second? Yeah, a second. That's for a vote. Sorry, fix that. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Congratulations. Mr. I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys have to be closer. You Aye. Pick it up. Mm -hmm. you guys are up. All right. Now we can go to the approval of minutes. Yes. Right. Do you have a? I move that we approve the uh, previous meeting meetings minutes from November the tenth. Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Next, citizens' comments. Um, do we have any citizens that want to speak today? We didn't receive any requests or any written comment, but I know that there's a number. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, so no citizens' comments today. Um, highlights of departmental reports. Uh, we'll start with the fire department. Interim Chief Briscoe. Good morning. Uh, you have, uh, Ms. Fergoso has so kindly mailed out the uh, packages to you. So you have the uh, packages in front of you, but please, at any time that I'm going over this, if you have any questions, please let me know right then because I'm kind of old and I forget real quick. So if you think of something, just stop me and say, hey, let me ask this, Chief. All right, so as we're going through. So uh, we had five in November. Let's start with November because we've got November and December that I need to give you. Five fire calls in November, 28 EMS, two rescues, one hazmat, four service, and 17 others. Okay, very good. All right, so what I'll do then is switch to the next page and hit just the notable calls and events and highlights of the program. On 11-1, November 1st, fire crews responded to a reported structure fire on Carolina Boulevard. Upon arrival, the homeowner explained that there was a small fire in the yard which included pine straw grass. It appeared, I, I answered that call as well, 
it appeared that there was a palm tree there and that the fire had actually started in the palm tree. Okay. Uh, on 11 1 also, fire crews responded to a sinking boat at the docks behind uh, Morgan Place Drive. Upon arrival, the fire crews found the boat was sinking with aft already underwater. Uh, a neighbor had attempted to pump it out. The fire department used a portable pump uh, to bring the boat upright. Uh, the neighbor was able to get a hold of the uh, home or the boat owner and to get the boat raised out of the water and placed into a jet dock. All units cleared and they were reported back to the in service. On the fourth, fire crews responded to a reported uh, person who had jumped off the Isle of Palms Connector. We talked about this a little bit last meeting, which was November 4, October meeting. Uh, this was a, a great opportunity for mutual aid with law enforcement, with the Isle of Palms Police Department, uh, Mount Pleasant Fire Department. Because of the long delay, we called uh, Mount Pleasant. Chief Mixon is great to work with, their, their department. They have been really good working with us on a, on a mutual aid. Uh, but they, they, came, they sent their rope team over. We used our ladder truck they did the rope work off of our ladder truck down to the person, retrieved them, gave them over to EMS, treated, everything was good. Law enforcement did the investigation. I'm sure he'll explain uh, more about that. On uh, the 6th, uh, Interim Chief Briscoe, Deputy Chief Hathaway, and Firefighter Marlowe provided incident command and medical oversight for Lavello, uh, the bike ride. Uh, on the 14th, Fire crews responded to a report of a structure fire on 31st. Upon arrival, the homeowner stated the fire was out. A thorough inspection of the chimney and flu showed that there were no heat indicates, no heat indications, and no signs of hidden fire. Something that I've run across in my career that, that you don't have that many of here, but you do. And that is flu liners in the flues are terracotta. And so if they're on, if the chimney is on fire, if it is truly a chimney fire, and we use a Pearson nozzle or a cellar nozzle and, and drop water down in that chimney, it's gonna crack the flue liner for the homeowner. So what we've done in the past is we have made a thing called chimney bombs. And that's dry chemical fire extinguishing agent in a plastic bag that we can just drop down in there. And that kind of makes a mess in the homeowner's house but it doesn't do structural damage to the house. And so since this call, uh, this call actually initiated us to put chimney bombs on our trucks mm -hmm. and the folks to use them. Some of our folks had, had some previous history with them, so they were familiar. But this should help the homeowners on Isle of Palms, reducing, if there were to be some structural damage, this should help it out. <clears throat> Excuse me. On 11 18, Je Deputy Chief Hathaway and Fire Marshal Stafford received smoke detectors from Service Master for assisting the residents of uh, the city of Isle of Palms. This was a grant of smoke detectors. Uh, again, this is, this is pretty neat uh, for those of the folks that are listening at home or watching. Uh, if you will contact the fire department, if you'll contact the fire marshal, Travis Stafford. Uh, we can get those in your home at no charge, okay? And and we'll be glad to put those up for you. Chair, if I may ask a yes. question. Uh, uh, Chief Briscoe, do, is, that, is that a one-time grant or an ongoing yearly renewable type grant? It, it, it's a, it's a one-time for them. We may get it again next year, but if we don't from them, we will get it. From, we, we pursue FEMA. Uh, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, they do that as well. Uh, so we have we have other uh, avenues to help okay. our to so help there our are systems. options. I mean, you pretty yes, much sir. Sure That's that correct. If you put in for a grant, you're going to get some assistance. It yes. Matter who it's from, what agency? Doesn't matter to me. I, yeah. I'm I'm uh, I'm all for uh, whether it's uh, firehouse subs or <laughs> or service master. Doesn't matter to me right. if if they're willing to give the city not give, to work with Isle, uh, Isle of Palms mm -hmm. City. And it doesn't come from 
the taxpayer having to pay for it, I'm all for it. <laughs> well, we pay for it anyway, but in, in other ways. But yes, sir. No, it, it does not matter of uh, this if if we get it from Service Master or FEMA or or whoever it is, we, we're, right. we're glad right. to receive. And we will work toward this constantly, working toward our grants so that so that our citizens will have this available to them continue. This will continue. Uh, on the 23rd, we put a brand new fire engine in the service, 1002. That's at station two. Uh, so you have a ladder and an engine and a rescue and a boat and a jet ski at headquarters station. And you have two boats, a fire boat and a rescue boat at station two, along with an engine and another ladder, a 95 foot ladder truck. So we have a 95 foot and a 75 foot ladder, okay? So that went into service on the 23rd. Also on the 23rd, fire crews responded to motor vehicle accident on 22nd Avenue. Uh, fire department found the accident to be automobile versus moped, which is not good. Uh, we transported, helped with that. Fire crews responded to a motor vehicle accident on the 25th. Isle of Palms Connector uh, found sports utility vehicle had collided with a street sweeper. The next page on your report are stats. Those are provided for you so that you can kind of look over the stats. And uh, I won't go into it. Today. Can I ask a question about them? Yes. Um, it, it shows that. Um, there's a spike in non-resident total calls. Okay. On the second page, on the first page, it's just there. There's also an increase in EMS, rescue, hazmat, and other calls. Correct. Is that because there are more people on the island? I, I, honestly, uh, if you look back to July 2020, that's when it it really spiked. It went from 126 in 2020 to to 156 in 2021. I think COVID had a lot to do with that. And to answer your question, I'm, I'm going around the tree, but yes, uh, more people here on the island because of COVID, they were allowed to get out of their houses. They were allowed to come to the beach. They, they got out there. So that meant more jellyfish things. That meant more uh, people with respiratory problems in their, in their condos. Uh, so yes, that's that's the reason that it went up. Uh, so the non-residential going up would be places like uh, businesses, if they were there in a business and had an issue, uh, if they were on the beach and had an issue, that's that's why that that's why you see that, sir. Thank you. You yes, can sir. also tie it, um, Council Member Hahn, to the accommodations tax revenue that we've had just shows that there's a lot of people staying on the island, not necessarily just in the summer. We're seeing that throughout. And I guess through COVID, a lot of people decided to stay home, work from home, virtual school. Um, and I guess we're seeing that reflected in, in these numbers as well. Um, certainly we don't, it doesn't look like we've had a, the, the typical season where it just picks up in the summer and then it drops down. We're yeah. There's not been an off stable. season. Yes, yeah. ma'am. You're right. That, that, Almost a forty percent increase yeah. over twenty twenty in total calls. Is that stressing the resources? Uh, no, sir. I don't think so. You know, we're we're always wanting more resources. We're wanting more people. We're wanting more trucks and boats and and as you'll see later on today. But uh, we are we are handling it. Uh, would it? Would I say or would the department say? If you offered to hire nine more people, would we turn it down? No, sir. That would be great. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, sir, we are the citizens of Isle of Palms are in great shape. Thank you. Yes. Sir. I will say too that when you look at 2020 numbers, they're somewhat um, skewed because in 2020 we had, you know, um, shutdowns and, and um, you know, we had the restrictions on the beach for several months. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, we have to maybe look at 2019 as more of a regular year than 2020, because again, with the pandemic, some people were traveling, others were not. So 
it's Agreed. yeah there's a little bit of a um we just have a caveat i guess when looking at numbers from 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 that from that year and in 2020 even though we had some people who came and stayed second homes or whatever they typically were not getting out very much correct yeah. correct yes sir that's correct um what i'd like to suggest that you look at too is um peak season versus off peak is the increase that we're showing during the off peak season when we do have extra capacity to okay. have more people around right. rather than the peak season, which is already probably at capacity. Mm -hmm. is, is that what's happening? I, I think that, that as, as Ms. Fergoso has said, we're, we don't have a season anymore. It seems like that, that right. it's elongated to where people are here even through Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. Yes, ma'am. All right, uh, December, uh, two fire calls, 24 EMS, four rescue, no hazmat, two service, and 23 other calls. Um, on the 2nd of December, fire crews responded to a reported structure fire on 21st Avenue. Upon arrival, fire department personnel learned that there had been a small fire confined to the microwave. Now, if you have burnt any plastic in the microwave, you know how it smells. So our time there was spent with smoke removal. I had an opportunity to be on that call as well. So folks did a great job. On the second, Deputy Chief Hathaway, Fire Marshal Stafford attended Goodnight Lights. If you've not had a chance to do that, that's at the Medical University of South Carolina, the Shaw Jenkins Children's Hospital. Uh, at, once it gets dark, the lights come on, on the emergency apparatus, the fire and police, uh, EMS, and then the kids flash their flashlights back that they're provided, letting us know that there's telling us good night. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, it's something that I've never seen before in a community. So I think it bodes well for this community to see that. Uh, and it, it not only to see it, but just to be part of it. It's pretty cool. On the 4th, Fire Marshal Stafford provided fire prevention displays at the Isle of Palms Holiday Festival. On the 5th, he provided a fire prevention display for St. Mark's Christmas celebration. On the 8th, Trooper Bob provided lunch for the on-duty fire personnel to highlight our department in recognition of the first responders. Mayor Pounds and City Administrator Fergoso also came by and uh, thanked the folks that were on duty, and that was just a good thing. Uh, it's happened a couple of times. Uh, we're trying to talk them into hitting the police department pretty soon. Though. So we're, we're, we're really proud of that. Uh, fire crews respond, responded to a reported structure fire on Palm Boulevard. Upon arrival, firefighters noticed that smoke haze inside the residence. It was found that a plastic container uh, that was atop the stove melted on top of the surface of the stove. Uh, again, the majority of the time was spent with smoke removal. And of course, the, the smell in the structure uh, is always tough. On the night, Deputy Chief Hathaway and Fire Marshal Stafford, Firefighter Hermosillo and L Luciano attended the Good Night Lights uh, again. They do that on Thursday, right, Chief? Yeah. So, it, so it's every Thursday in in December. And again, I, I wasn't familiar with that, but I was very impressed. Very impressed. On the sixth, the promotional test was conducted. And uh, for the position of fire captain, Chris Fassos was promoted to the rank of fire captain. He's at station two. And the reason that we had the promotion, uh, and I'll speak to that later, uh, Captain Bacon retired. And so that's how the reason that we had a, a opening for a promotion. And lastly, on the 16th, Fire Marshal Stafford attended the goodnight lights in, in the event uh, at uh, Medical Center or Medical University of South Carolina, the Shaw Jenkins Children's Hospital. Questions, comments, or ugly remarks? <laughs> well, I have to say, I, you know, not having been on public safety <coughs> in the past, I have reviewed these monthly reports that you and Chief Cornette do. Uh, these are well done. There's Thank a lot you. of information in Thank here. You. You Chief know. Hathaway gets all the credit. Yeah, I get none, uh, zero, you know, I, none. <laughs> I, mean, I would just encourage any resident or anyone out there that would like to really Please. see what goes on in terms yeah. of the analytics and what our departments yeah. do each and every month. Just dig into this if they like, if they so choose. Yeah. Because uh, 
We're a small island, but we have some busy public safety departments out here. Thank you, sir. And thank and you, you are you're thank you, sir. You are correct in that if if they if the general public would like to ask questions, if they would pose them to Miss Fergoso, she gets them to me. I promise you, very promptly. <laughs> so, uh, do that that that's great, sir. Thank you so much, Miss Street. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? Very good. Very sorry. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All your Good morning. Thank you all for joining us and being a part of the Public Safety Committee. I will run through ours. It is a little bit more brief. Uh, for our significant department actions, you're really just going to get a rundown of December for this one. But you can see all the different things that we participated in. One of the ones that I really want to talk about are the, or would be the participation in the Toys for Tots. And I want to bring that up because that's something we do every year. Typically, Chief Graham in the past had coordinated that. This year, there was a little bit of a lull. So communication specialist Dawson grabbed it and ran with it. And between all the city employees and the residents, I can't say how impressed I am with this city for giving for Toys for Tots. It's, it's amazing every year to see what everybody puts into that. And we're proud to be a part of that and to host that. Some of the things to point out, we did participate in Sober or Slammer, uh, which is a statewide thing. It's actually bigger than just the state, but we were doing it during that that kickoff with the South Carolina Highway Patrol and the law enforcement network for our area. We did host the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Association Media and Public Relations course. This is the first time that we have hosted a PIO type class down here. And the company was really hesitant because they said, you know, we don't know if we're gonna fill the class. And I said, it's the beach. People wanna to come to the beach. Uh, and they were so amazed because we filled the class within two weeks and we had to start turning people away. We have people from other states that were down here so it went so well that they've reached out to us and we will be hosting a second version of that in March here on site, which is a big uh, feather in the cap for us to be a, an agency that's hosting those type of classes. And Some of the great weather. Mm -hmm. it, it is. That's, I said, <laughs> if we fill that one, we're definitely going to fill the March class. That's oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one of the other things we did in December is we did host the annual awards banquet for our officers. It's something we have done every year since I've been here, and it's just a way to recognize them for the work that they have done throughout the year. Some of the main highlights would be the officer of the year was FTO Mobley. And then supervisor for the year was Sergeant Craig Thompson. And professional staff of the year was communications specialist Dawson. And then we did issue two certificate of merits to two of our employees who were involved with the connector bridge. And that would be Sergeant Storin and FTO Santuli. They were recognized for that incident because they saw an abandoned vehicle on the side of the road. Most officers would ride up stick a sticker on it that it's got to be removed and they would move on about their business. But these officers saw something that looked out of the ordinary. They continued to investigate. Uh, and even when they felt like they, they couldn't find anything else, they had contact everybody. Uh, they, they had something in their mind that said, we got to keep working. And then they wound up looking over the side and found this individual in the water in 46 degree weather uh, mm -hmm. and coordinated all the response to help get them out. So it was, uh, it was an honor to recognize both of them for that. We did also participate in Good Night Lights. It is a tremendous experience. Next year, if you were interested in participating, we would welcome you to join us and go out there. Uh, it is very touching to be a part of that. When you look at our statistics, you can see the different things. Um, calls for service were down for 2021 compared to 2020. We weren't like most places in 2020. The law enforcement agency, uh, our, the police department, we saw an increase in 2020 for calls for service and an increase in a lot of different things. So. I think we're actually closer to where we normally were in 2021 than we are than when we look at 2020. Incident reports were also down. However, traffic stops did go up, and that is a testament to the work of our officers. That was something that we had a lot of concerns from our residents on. We've created a traffic unit that once we get fully staffed, we'll be standing that unit up that will focus primarily on enforcing traffic laws so that we can protect our residents and work on traffic safety issues as well. Coyote sightings were up for 2021 compared to 2020, uh, significantly up if you look at that number. Uh, I am glad to say that over the last couple of months, those numbers have dropped down the sightings, uh, but that is something to, to definitely point out. When you look at reports by offenses, I want to point out that you only see 2021 down there. That's because this is a new report 
that we are able to run through our new records management system. So we don't have the data to match it specifically and make it apples to apples. Uh, so that's why you don't have 2020 in there. But those are just reported offenses. When you look in the other one that says charges, those are the ones where we made charges for types of offenses. And significant points for those would be that gun violations, those are unlawful weapon violations, unlawful carry, whatever it is, those doubled in 2021. Still a small number, but it did go up for us, as well as all the drug-related crimes increased as well in 2021. DUIs also went up uh, quite a bit as well. Last year, we were the DUI Enforcement Agency of the Year, and our numbers still went up. I believe. I, I, I was going to wait till you finish, oh. Chief, on that, but I had a question about just generally about the charges. Sure. I just, I mean, they're up significantly over 2020, guys. <laughs> a lot of that's going to be that we have new officers, and new officers are getting out here. They're being a little more aggressive. Uh, when we're targeting these different types of crimes like DUIs, uh, we have a lot of training that went into DUI enforcement over the last year because that is something that is significantly impacting everywhere in the United States. So that's why you see a lot of those going up. We're proactively addressing those crimes. And some of the others, I can't tell you why those numbers went up as far as the drugs and the, uh, the guns. Uh, I think that is something that we're seeing nationwide right now where we're seeing more crimes go up. Crimes in general nationwide have increased and lucky for us that when we look at these, our property crimes went down for the most part. Our major crimes and violent crimes did not increase at all. They, they stayed about the same. And that's a positive note for us because other, other municipalities and jurisdictions cannot say the same thing. Uh, so that it, it, they, they did go up. And, and I, I'm not sure exactly what caused that, but it's something that's being felt in law enforcement all across the nation right now. Would you attribute some of the increase because they're, they're more... I don't know the term. Day tripper is what comes to mind. The more transient people that are coming to the island, would you attribute any of that to the reason for the increase? It's hard to say. Uh, most of these drug charges are coming from traffic stops, majority of them. Uh, only a few in 2021. Uh, there were several that came from residents on the island and, and some that were search warrants. Our first search warrant ever was executed for a methamphetamine case here on the island uh, at a residence. And, and so most of it, you could say that, but I'm not, I can't say that 100% right now. I could find those stats. We do kind of track them. It's, it can be kind of skewed, too. That's why we don't put it in the report. It's not as easy to say resident, non-resident. Um, we can, but then it's going to – ours is broken down. Jurisdiction, state, out of state, and unknown. And what we really strive for is jurisdiction should be people that live here. But then what we run into is people that are renting here may have an out-of-state or a different location uh, address on their driver's license, they may be coded as a state as opposed to jurisdictional. We can pull those stats and I could give you better information on it. Just understand they won't be 100% concrete. Sure. So that I understand the terminology, resident means anybody that's sleeping on the island. So would that include hotels? No, sir. That would be short term rentals. It, not short term rentals, long term rentals is what we're, and we've got a couple of those now that we've issued tickets to that have not changed their addresses. Technically, they have to by law, and we could write them another ticket if they don't change your address within 10 days. Uh, but just because you can doesn't mean you have to write tickets either. So, but most of it, it'll be a little skewed. It's not going to be far off. I think we could get those numbers and pull those stats. So, so you don't have numbers then that would delineate between people that are sleeping on the island versus people that come here for the day? No, sir. We wouldn't be able, wouldn't to, be able to, to delineate. Okay. Thank no, you. Sir. That was Good indication of that seems to be these heat maps that you show the mm -hmm. density of, of incidents. It's all right down in the, the business area. It is. And a lot of these will come from that, that area where you see the higher, um, the red, num red marks on the map. Well, we don't know what percentage of those offenses by looking at the heat map where it's red or whatever. Uh, we don't know whether they're we don't track whether the residents are all violators. We could pull whether they have a license that puts them within our jurisdiction or not. Uh, but some of those may be short-term rentals that are, I mean, believe it or not, our, our DUIs on golf carts significantly went up this year as well. Um, and a lot of people from out of state don't realize you can get a DUI on a golf cart. But when they're coming, one thing to keep in mind, 
the only areas opened after a certain period of time where people can go out and do those things are front beach. And so right. if they're leaving from that area and they get stopped, that's why you see that higher area there. We could tell you if they live here, I won't necessarily be able to tell you if there's somebody that just drove in just to go down to one of the businesses and leave, or if it's somebody who's got a short-term rental down the street. I can get that uh, if that's something you're interested in getting in the future. I'll just break it down by jurisdiction versus non-jurisdiction. Okay, I, just I don't want to send you off on a wild goose chase at all. I, I'm trying to, and, and the purpose of, of my question is trying to understand the cost that the city is is bearing for people that are here on the island, staying on, sleeping on the island is the way I would look at it versus people that are not sleeping on the island. And if that is increased, because there's been a lot of discussion about increased population in Charleston County in general, and those people are coming to the beach, we want them to come to the beach, obviously. I'm just trying to understand the difference in that group of people versus people sleeping on the island and what, what those, those costs are to, to the city. And the only thing I could tell you is if they are a resident that has an address here or they don't. Mm -hmm. and so I wouldn't be able to tell you if they're short-term rental or so, so that does, that doesn't really help us. So don't, don't go down that rabbit hole. Okay. Well, we wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to know when they stop or have a you know, situation, whether they're here for the day or if you're staying either at a short-term rental or a hotel or live there. There's no. I, I figure that's where you're going and I couldn't, I couldn't, I've tried to find ways to get that information and there's not a concrete way for us to gather that in, in an efficient way. We have certain things we have to mark when we do incident reports or tickets and they give us the ability to pull whether they live here or don't, but that's all we've been able to pull that would give us a, a legitimate number. It would be helpful to know how many of, of your incidents are residents, if that's an easy thing to pull. We can pull that, it, well, what, not what, necessarily what? incidents, but uh, what we could pull is where the individual charged is a resident yeah, or non-resident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it that on the island or, or not? Um, I think. I don't want to speak. We should be able to. It should be on the incident report. We should be able to pull that information, but I can play with it and see if that's something I can bring yeah. you some information on. I think it'd be interesting to know what proportion of the, um, you know, of, of the, you're not calling them incidents, I don't know what you call them, um, the people detained, you know. The charged. Charged. Um, whether there are, are residents citizens or whether they're off-island and off-island visitors i would consider off-island they might be staying at the hotel or whatever mm -hmm. as well as day trippers but right. that would be interesting to know that sure. yeah, we can, can make some assumptions course. with with that distinction at some yeah. point we wouldn't know for sure but you know if, if you separate it by people who live on the island and those yeah. who don't with an island address with an island address yeah. those who don't then we can make some assumptions at that point yeah, yeah. yeah. we can work on that uh, I did want to point out before I jump into the rest of the graphs, uh, another one I wanted to point out that went up was the business license charges. And I want to credit that specifically to uh, working with Ms. Desiree to create a code enforcement position. Because what we found is we had a lot of businesses that were coming onto the island during the weekends and during these off hours, and they were not obtaining the proper business license like they were supposed to. So we created this code enforcement to address those and help address some of the livability and he has done a tremendous job at working to get these businesses to get their business license. At the end of the day, what we're really looking for is for those businesses to be in compliance and get their business license, um, not so much how many tickets we can write or anything like that. Are those retail or a Airbnb or what kind of licenses? Any business that's supposed to have a business license, if he comes across it, if it's a business that's operating on the island, they're supposed to have a license. And if he finds that they don't have one, then he would issue a citation uh, until they got their business license and got it corrected. So that for example, if somebody, correct, yeah. landscapers, correct. Um, yeah. pressure washing sure, companies, yeah. right. you know, whatever, they mm -hmm. would need a, a business license. And we were seeing that we were having a lot of violations there, um, all, you know, during the weekends or um, later in the evening. So having this dedicated position has helped us in um, uh, monitoring that and enforcing. I gotta say, I see the code enforcement officer all over the island here. He is a, a, a big asset for us. He helps more than just business license. Mm -hmm. uh, he is as versatile as they come. Yeah. So nice I'm glad to see that. Some of the things I, want, I wanted to point out that we will have coming up, you'll see them on our social media. We will be hosting a virtual copy with a cop. We're going to stay virtual for the first one. And, and then hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to host a live copy with a cop. 
And then we're going to go back to our neighborhood meetings. In 2019, we started doing neighborhood meetings, and I thought they were great to share information and statistics with our residents. We'd like to get back to that as, as soon as we could do that in a safe manner uh, without spreading any of the, the COVID. Uh, so we will, we will work on seeing that. That's something you'll see in the future. When you look at your maps or your graphs on the next page, you'll see that the police department vacancies don't be alarmed with the BSOs. We're just at that point where we start reaching out to hire BSOs right now. BSOs don't start with us until March 1st, typically. We'll keep one or two on staff uh, during the entire year so they can help out with parking enforcement. But then you'll see those numbers, they should go down. We've already reached out to all of our local colleges, the Citadel, uh, Charles, um, Charleston Southern College, Charleston, trying to reach out to some of those areas to recruit some of their students to come over and be BSOs for the summer. Uh, the Citadel supplied, we wound up getting about six or seven from the Citadel last year. And they're great because they understand coming out, doing a job. We're not playing around. We're doing work. You're not, you don't get to come play, play on your phone all day long. Uh, so with the police department vacancies for police officer, while that number looks lower, the thing to point out is we have two that are in field training right now. That means they're not on the road by themselves. They can't answer calls on their own. So they really don't help. So that's two more that would be on top of the vacancies. And then we have one that is out on FMLA that has been out for several months. Um, so that's another one that we're still dealing with the shortage here. And then two that we've hired that are in waiting to go to the academy. They go on the 23rd. They will go on the 23rd to the academy for two months. When they graduate, they'll come back and they'll have about two and a half months of field training before they are solo on their own. So they'll be out just in time for summer. One good thing to point out is we recently used LinkedIn. We've, we've posted on a lot of different sites to get our jobs out there. And for some reason here recently, LinkedIn has been the, the, the place because we've, in the last couple of weeks, we've had several applicants that have come in from LinkedIn. Uh, so that's a positive thing. We've got some that we're able to work with now. So Chief, if that, I think I followed your math here. So instead of three vacancies on police officers, we really right now, for all practical purposes, have more like eight or nine. Because that's correct. Waiting for you would have... About eight. Eight would be where right. we're at now. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. That okay. we're currently, we, we have and we're using detectives and special support services personnel to help kind of cover those. And even command staff has, have, have come in to help cover when we've been short. I've worked some shifts. The, the captain and the lieutenant have all come in and worked some shifts. It's good for us, too, because it reminds us that we're still police officers like everybody else. Right. And the BSOs, when we're fully staffed, I don't think we're ever really fully staffed on BSOs, but if, what would we consider fully we, staffed during the peak so season? If we got nine, nine is what we're allotted. I think the closest we came to that since I've been here is we had seven at one point, maybe eight, mm -hmm. uh, but we've never had the full nine since I've been here. And it's just, it's hard to find people that want to come in and do part-time. And then of course, with everything going on in the world these days, uh, getting people to come in and work in general can, can be difficult for any, any job. Uh, but we will start reaching out. We've really, the hope is that the Citadel will be another successful uh, because we had, we didn't have any from any other college last year, but the Citadel really delivered with a lot of them. Do they get credit when they take a job like that during the summer? They don't. That's something we hope to do in the, in the future is we're really trying to partner with these criminal justice programs yeah. at these agencies so that maybe we can do something like that. We did take in, in 2021 and 2020, we brought in two interns, which was nice. That was the first time we had done that. Uh, we don't have any scheduled right now, but that's, we're really trying to build that partnership. So maybe that's something they could get. That seems to me like that would be a real, real mm -hmm. good enticement for mm -hmm. someone to take a, a thankless job like that, really. I would agree. <laughs> well, it's 95 degrees out there still watching them, writing those, uh, writing those tickets for illegal parking or whatever. But, you know, maybe something to pursue. Certainly. And we did also, we talked and we've increased the starting pay for our BSOs. So it's a little more enticing that way as well. Um, so, but definitely I like that approach. It's something we want to continue to work towards. I really already kind of talked about drug and gun and DUI charges when I was talking earlier, but you can see I broke them down by the quarter. And so you can kind of see which ones were the, the busiest. And the DUIs typically are going to be higher that last quarter of the year. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the holidays or what it is, but you do see more impaired driving take place during the holiday season. So that's not too alarming to me that that, that is a higher quarter for us. When you look at parking citations, I tried to break that down uh, by peak season and off season. 
and, and what our typical peak season. So for parking, March through October is when we're doing parking enforcement. So that's why you have those months separated from the others. And that's why they're higher than the others, because that's when we're doing all the front beach parking, all of that residential parking, all of that continues year round. Underneath that, you see animal control calls for service. And these were over this mid part of the year, we had a lot of calls dealing with raccoons. And those numbers have drastically decreased at this point. So we're excited with that. We, we got past the curve that we were seeing, uh, but still that's why those numbers are still high in that fourth quarter. We were still seeing them. I, I'd say within the last December, we started to see those numbers drastically drop for us. So you trap and remove animals from residences? We can. Um, really, we don't really trap and remove them. But for the raccoons, what we we're seeing is we had a lot of sick raccoons. Um, and we actually captured some and, and had them tested for rabies and they were negative. Uh, but we were working with DNR and DHEC to address an obvious issue where we had several sick raccoons um, that, that did have to be addressed. So we would catch them because we didn't want to leave them at the residence or anything like that. And we would work with them to take okay. care of that. that so issue. when it's a public health issue, you're Yes, ma'am. Or sometimes we'll get a call for an alligator at a house that's got too close uh, and he might be too big or he might be getting feeling too comfortable. We will remove that alligator and, and we may relocate them or work with DNR to, to address those as well because they'll come out and help us. So there's no animal control agency? We, we have an animal control officer okay. that he will work with those and he spent a better part of the beginning of December actually becoming certified. Um, so that's, that was a positive thing for us. But we do rely on those partnerships with DNR because if we do it wrong, DNR is the one that's going to come after us. So we really, instead of doing it wrong and then letting them come after us, we build that relationship up front. So say, hey, is there a better way we could do this than what we're doing now? Um, and typically they've been great to work with. If, if it's something that's beyond our capacity, they will come out and help with us. We do work with like birds of the wild or some of these other organizations that work with the animals that we don't typically see in animal control. It's hard to train an animal control officer here because when you find animal control officers certifications, they're training them on raccoons, cats, dogs. But out here we're dealing with wild birds, protected birds. We're dealing with alligators, with snakes and all these different things that we have that not every animal control officer deals with. Um, so we, we really get training from those other organizations to help us address how to deal with them in the right way. Okay. Chief, did the DNR figure out why the raccoons were sick? Uh, they were saying, they didn't test them for anything else, but basically they're, what DHEC was saying was it was distemper is what they believed it was. Um, so we did finally curve that and we've seen that decrease significantly now. The last one I responded to that came out as a sick raccoon actually turned out to be a raccoon that got his paw caught in something and he was just hurt. Um, and we're able to catch them. And what we do with those is we catch those and we get them to an organization that can help heal them and release them back into the wild. But that it was distemper is what they were, what they were saying they believed it was based on all the, the fact that it was not rabies, but it was still very similar. They said they thought it was yeah, distemper. I saw two of them. Yes. Sir. Now the coyote, coyote issue, but we don't really know why that spikes and decreases. Well, we could kind of follow it with when they're, when they're having litters and when it's yeah. breeding season. Uh, and then, you know, what we've really had the issue with in the past, we've been able to put our traps out on public lands because that's where we're allowed to trap. Uh, but unfortunately, the coyotes didn't go to those spots. We would do our best to guess and see the tracks where they were and put them in that area. But what we found is they were moving into residential areas that were private property that we were not able to go put traps on. So we did work with some homeowners to get some trappers out there and, and get some several trapped this year and, and taken off the island. Pretty wildly of it, right? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> if we could just get a roadrunner out here, I think we could solve it. <laughs> are, you, are you interested in, in us inviting the public to give you permission to trap on their property? That's something that we have worked with with Desiree and the legal counsel to see what we what we can and cannot do there because it puts a lot of liability on us, but there are ways that we might be able to work around that. We're currently in the process of doing that. We've come up with a little waiver that, that we want legal to say, this looks good before we move. I mean, you understand that. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Probably absolutely. better than I do. Before we get into that, I think we need to 
to consider how many calls we may be burdening the police department with. Well, or they could reach out too. If, if they if they got a hot spot, maybe they could reach out. It's just I mean, that's something we could do proactively instead of just asking questions about wild animals. We could set up so that you could trap on private property. That was well, and that was kind of what we looked at when we looked at this liability and do we because we're really not not supposed to but we say hey you know when we find our place ourselves in a spot where they were in the dunes next to a heavily accessed path so we need to look and be a little more creative and we saw we thought outside the box and that's why we've come up with the waiver that we did that maybe this is different than just one or two but these were we started to see where coyotes were coming out of the dunes and they were standing in the walkway and they were less afraid of people so we said we have to address this in a different manner and that's what got us moving forward with the path that we're on right now thank you well, I was just wondering if maybe you could help private citizens know how they could remove coyotes from their property. And we do that. That's our. That's what we normally do. And that's the practice that we'll continue to use unless it's an area like that one that was around uh, Access Path 2025 that was just a, a heavily traveled path. And it, it got to the point where the coyotes were comfortable on the path. We realized we had to take different actions than we were doing. Um, so that's, but typically that's what we're going to do. We're, okay. we don't want to be in the business of going on private property and trapping, no. uh, but when we could tie it back to a public safety concern, because now they're, it's impacting the safety of multiple people coming out and into that area, we, we can address it a little bit differently. Okay. We, we have a coyote management page on our website that includes all that information um, and, and who to reach out to the timing of the year that they're allowed to trap and um, certify trappers for folks to um, hire on their own. Okay, good. I'll say this firsthand too, uh, I've seen this and heard this firsthand, coyotes love the sound of sirens, whether it's police or fire department, particularly at night. Yes. They start howling. <laughs> <laughs> they do, they certainly do. You do see, I, I think I have November here because I did not update it with December because we didn't have an increase in calls, but the animal control type, animal type, mm -hmm. those are all raccoons. Um, that was what November looked like for us. When you look down at the bottom, you can see the stats. Those are broken down by October, November, December. That's because we just started making this graph in October. So that was new. And then the last page for that section for December, you see the heat map for December. And then next to that, you can see the crime class types for incidents reported for December, and then the next two pages would be for all of 2021, uh, the density map, and then the crime class types. Are there any questions with any of those? Chair, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, it, it's really basically reinforcing what I said with the fire department too. Chief, I, I, I just want to commend you and your group for everything you do to be involved in the community. You know, whether it's the coffee with the cop program or whatever, but like, uh, you know, the teenagers, you know, serving their lunch for them. All of those type of activities, I think, probably just help make us a stronger community. And I really personally want to thank you as a, as a citizen for what you and your team are doing. I think it's, I think it's a really positive uh, effort that's being made by you and your department as well as the fire department. I appreciate that. We, we have a philosophy in the police department that we simply cannot be successful if we don't have a partnership with the community that we serve. And we just want to continue to build that partnership with residents, businesses, day trippers, visitors, anybody, because that's we're not successful without them. I'd like to second that, too. And thank you for your service. And um, I love the, the goal of being a peace officer rather than a, a control, because nobody likes to be controlled. Um, I think that's a great way to, to approach it. Um, all right. Is there any other business, any other questions for the chief? Thank you. I'm going to stand right here. Yeah, he's going to stay there. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I do want him to address um, several points of the next item. All right. The next order of business is the discussion and consideration of or ordinance 2021.16 and the ordinance to include restriction of vicious or dangerous dogs. So you have a copy in your packet, a copy of um, this ordinance that was developed, um, a lot of uh, feedback from the Public Safety Committee the past few months. Um, this ordinance has already been approved by council for first reading, so it'll be before you all again later this month for second reading and ratification. Um, the main um, component of this ordinance is including in our code a, a definition of what dangerous dogs is 
um, vicious dogs, and then new penalties for um, violating the vicious dog um, um, ordinance. Um, the penalties involve a $250 citation for the first violation and $500 for a second violation. And the reason that this ordinance was developed is the city, we were seeing um, a lot of incidents with dogs um, off leash, dogs on the beach, dogs that were attacking other dogs or attacking people. And um, we did not have the language in the code that would facilitate the police department in enforcing and being able to um, issue citations, if you will. Um, the, only, um, the only violation or the only uh, regulation that we had at the time uh, currently in our code is the dog at large. And there were times when you know, uh, attacks were happening, but the dog was not off leash. Um, so this ordinance would allow the department or the officer um, responding to these types of calls to um, charge an owner from having a vicious dog or a dangerous dog that is has a propensity uh, to attack other dogs or humans and then have a different uh, mechanism, I guess, for them to um, address those situations. So I, I don't, if, if just for the benefit of the whole group, since, since this is a new public safety um, committee, to hear from the chief about what, what were some of the challenges that, just that his folks were having and how this um, new, new ordinance would facilitate their um, efforts to um, address these issues on, on the beach and really anywhere on the island. So as Ms. Fergoso uh, stated earlier, this really came from the incidents involving dog bites somewhere on the island. And, and a lot of a lot of talk goes into the fact that these were happening on the beach. Actually, very few were on the beach. More were off the beach uh, inland than they were on the beaches. But what we realized is that the, the conversation consistently went around the leash law violation, but there was nothing that gave us the ability to address the actual bite itself because a, an animal could be on leash or could be within the leash law violation or within the leash law and still make a bite uh, for whatever reason it is. And this gives us a clear definition of how to address that, I started looking into our neighboring agencies, and we were actually the only agency in the area that did not have something of this nature to be able to address these. Now, you could have an individual that gets charged with a leash law violation and mm -hmm. the vicious dogs violation, uh, or you could have somebody that's within the law, the scope of the law for the leash law, but still has a dog bite that's a violation of city ordinance, and we could still address those. That's what it really came to is giving us the ability to address the root cause of the bite. And then we can look at leash law, but there are times when a lot of conversations around the leash law and the subjectiveness of a dog that is off leash being obedient to a command. And an officer simply won't know that a dog's not obedient to a command until something happens. And by that time it's too late, you know? And so then we had a lot of people that were getting upset when we only wrote a leash law violation because in their eyes, that was not, the, the violation they were calling us about. And so this gives us the ability to address both of those as either one type of incident or one incident or two separate things. Um, I have a question about, um, I apologize, I didn't read this thoroughly, but I understand the violations and the dollar amounts, but th there is something in here that with what can be done with the dog. That's correct, yes ma'am. Can it be, it can be restricted to the owner's property? Is that's that, that's is correct. That? And that's within, that follows the same guidance that falls under state statute. So part of where this is important that we have that language in our ordinance is that our animal control officer is not a sworn police officer. Uh, so they don't have the ability to write state statutes. They can only write city ordinances. And this, so what would happen is when he saw a violation, he has to call a sworn police officer to come over and address those. This gives the ability for him to address those, him or her, to address those right there and not have to call a sworn police officer over. Okay, so so the dog is is taken into custody, let's say if it's a bite, and then the owner would have to pay a fine and then commit to keeping the animal on their property. That's correct. And then there are violations if they fail to follow through with that. But also we notify DHEC uh, that the dog has been declared as a dangerous dog and they keep a file on as well. And they send them a letter 
uh, which we've had these happen here in the past where they send a letter and they tell them that the, the dog has been declared as a dangerous dog and must be maintained. And it lays out the exact same things that are laid out in our ordinance. Okay. I've heard from several dog owners um, in our discussions uh, during the campaign. And what I was hearing was dog owners are in favor of this because people who lawfully take care of their dogs and train them and whatnot are happy to have these several vicious dogs controlled better so that everyone is happier, um, I think, with, with having dogs on the beach and around our community. Um, so it sounds like a good idea to me. Um, Rusty, you followed this more than us. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. We, well, we, you know, we discussed it in council last month and passed it at first reading, so we will be coming up for second reading. Uh, we vetted it very well in all of our conversations, and it seems, you know, to Chief Cornett's words, it gives him and his officers clear definition as to how this can be enforced without it being vague. And it really puts us in line with what other local municipalities and throughout the state are doing as well, right, Chief? That's correct, yes, sir. So I feel very comfortable. I know this came back to us as a new public safety committee for just for review, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I think this is this is solid as, a, as an ordinance, and I fully support it myself. Okay, Blair, do you have any comments? I don't. Do we need to make a recommendation? No, ma'am. It's already been, um, it was recommended by uh, the Public Safety Committee last year when it was presented to council um, in November. Um, this is, the, the, the code requires us to bring an ordinance back to the committee, to a, a spe spe specific committee for review um, and a further discussion. So there's no, there's no need for any action at this point. Um, you all will have an opportunity to vote um, on it at second reading. So just to be clear, there are no recommended changes to the ordinance from us. So we'd like to we It'll be presented it as, as it is presented here um, okay. at the end of the month to council. Yeah. Next order of business then. Thank you, Chief Cornett. Here's my favorite update on the study of the modifications to the Isle of Palms connector to include assessment of alternative configurations to improve traffic flow, pedestrian, and emergency access. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead. Yes, I'll go ahead and give an update. Um, we have um, provided SCDOT some feedback um, on the scope of work that they had provided to us. Um, our, our, the main components of the feedback that we that we gave was wanting to expand the scope to not only include a study of the current configuration and what other alternatives might be available to ensure that emergency access is you know a, a, a primary component of the um, IOP connector, while also accommodating you know bicycles and pedestrians because obviously we know that that is used by by that um, by that group. Um, but also looking at the intersections um, here down at Palm Boulevard and 14th Avenue, Rifle Range and Hungry Nave, which is, I think it's very important. Um, a lot of the conversation and the feedback that we provided was included um, just uh, signal timing on those intersections and also just a capacity assessment of, um, you know, at what point do, uh, is the connector full? And how do we manage traffic coming in and out of the island? Um, um, one of the things that we um, received, you know, we wanted to know from SCDOT's perspective is just expectations and time. You know, how long is the study going to happen, and when do we envision having a report to review uh, or some feedback uh, to review? And we're looking at a six-month process once the um, the engineers are are engaged. Um, I know, you know, Council, uh, Chair Anderson, you know, tra former traffic engineer, um, her and I, we've had some conversations and I've been um, providing the feedback that you've provided to me um, to SADOT for, for their consideration as we look at expanding that scope. And we've done that. So I think it's been very helpful, certainly to have you um, as part of our team to review this in coordination and in conjunction, I should say with um, Jennifer Bill from Bill Engineering, which will be acting as our um, sort of liaison from that, from that um, 
um, aspect in the um, scope. Um, the project will include um, community feedback um, and community meetings um, to gather feedback from, from our residents. Um, we'll include meetings with other local governments, obviously in, in, in this conversation, it's very important, the relationship and collaboration that we have with Mount Pleasant, Charleston County EMS. Um, so we, we're just making sure that the scope includes um, that level of coordination among um, all, all stakeholders. Um, is City of Isle of Palms coordinating or contacting and communicating with uh, Mount Pleasant and their traffic department on any of this? Not yet, not specifically to the study. I mean, we do that and the police department does that um, just as part of their normal operating procedures when it comes to preparing for big weekends um, and preparing for the season. Um, one thing that we're doing this year that um, I discussed with Mayor Pounds yesterday was um, hosting a um, meeting here with Charleston County, the, the County Park um, Executive Director, Mount Pleasant and us um, in preparation for this big summer. Um, you know, I, we don't, we, I think we, we can't expect any changes to, I don't think that we will have any changes happen on the connector before the beginning of the season. So we would definitely wanna prepare um, to be fully equipped and fully trained um, for this season as this study comes along. Okay, well, Mount Pleasant is responsible for maintaining the signals along the connector. So they have two, I'm told, two very good traffic engineers on staff, which is nice because um, we can work directly with them in, uh, and they can inform South Carolina DOT on mm -hmm. what they're doing. Well, we did last year, you all would remember at the beginning of the season, we had a lot of issues with that, the, the traffic light and the timing at that intersection. And um, Chief Cornett had you know, meetings with those folks and we were able to change that, um, that timing that helped significantly because the timing, I think it was letting one or two vehicles through before it came back and changed. Um, and we saw immediate um, yeah. relief once that happened. Yeah. Um, and that, even though it's an SDOT, traffic light, it's managed by Mount Pleasant, yes. which I think makes it easier for us to, um, to, to work with them to, to make the, those adjustments. Um, but we have to recognize too, they're managing the, the flow of traffic coming off of Hungry Neck and, and you know, balancing all the traffic coming off of the connector from IOP with the traffic that they have on, their, um, on those um, roads. But it is, it is a situation where our peak is their off peak. So there is some synergy there that we can work together with. Um, and I did learn that South Carolina DOT does pay the town of Mount Pleasant to maintain the signals. They do, there is a funding thing. And um, Chief Cornett, uh, I believe our signal here on Palm Boulevard is maintained now by South Carolina DOT, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Yeah, so you know, one of the things we may want to look at is changing that so that we have more control over how that signal is timed, um, specifically coordinating directly with, with the town of Mount Pleasant so that the whole corridor is coordinated in a, in a unified manner. Um, that's something I think for us to look at. And certainly with the, um, I mean, this is, this shows how everything is integrated, I think with the, with respect to the county parks, uh, one of the problems we have in the summertime is the parks park doesn't open until nine o'clock and traffic backs up on the on the connector waiting to get into the park if we can get the park to change the way they take their fees in maybe a park then pay rather than a paid in park kind of program um, that may be something that helps right there um, that's unrelated to south carolina dot so i think we need to to look at this from a number of different perspectives um, and hopefully get some cooperation with South Carolina DOT. I agree. And, and just for the, the benefit of the group, we initiated those conversations with the county park um, staff uh -huh. of, of trying to, you know, for them to understand the impact that what you just described, what that has on um, the connector and traffic overall in this intersection. Um, they're open to it. I think that they certainly have some challenges and some things that they would have to uh, put in place. Um, but I believe they're open and, and at the time they were evaluating um, kiosks, just a, a different method of payment so that people are not stopping there. 
Um, and part of this meeting that we wanna have with the mayor and, and, and um, the mayor of Mount Pleasant and, and the director for Charleston County is to have those discussions. You know, what, what do we, how can we help to facilitate that? Um, because it, 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 again, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's, um, it seems like there are very simple, low hanging fruit. Yes, exactly. Um, we can start there and they, then work on the hard problem. I agree. Um, the second thing is, I think we need to have a coordination meeting with uh, Town of Mount Pleasant and their uh, traffic department too. Because um, I did learn that they are looking at the connector and um, restriping the connector all the way up to the causeway. So um, it would be good if we knew what they had in mind so that when we go to DOT, that gives us more ammunition in terms of what we're gonna negotiate with them and how it would tie in. Um, so there, there's a lot of synergy here, I think that we can work on. Um, some of it that can be just like the signal timing at, at Hungry Neck, um, I mean, at um, rifle range, um, you can see immediate response to it, um, but just general overall coordination and, um, and hopefully benefiting from those traffic engineers that are right across the bridge that know a lot about what's happening over here. Um, and I was talking with one of the town council people over at Mount Pleasant, and he was talking about how their problem was traffic coming onto the island. So, um, you know, our problem is coming off the island. So there's definitely a, a, a coordination there that will benefit both sides. And I think it gives us an opportunity to, to really do something with the connector that might just ease the pain a little bit. We're never going to get rid of the traffic, but we could certainly make it flow a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Chair, if I could, uh, yeah. if, I, if I may, uh, a couple of comments here. I mean, this, this, of course, this has been going on for a while, and it really is a very high priority issue for our residents out here in regards to the restriping of the connector and how it, how it happened. And no matter what, I mean, it happened very quickly, very suddenly, without any real input from us. The fact of the matter is we control very little connector also I mean I guess our I guess our responsibilities go up to the flag post <laughs> pretty much <laughs> that's yeah. pretty much it so it's going to take a lot of coll collaboration between us Mount Pleasant Charleston County as we all have been discussing here so I'm optimistic that if we get all the different stakeholders together and really get into this thing that we can do some things that will help alleviate the pain anyway. I mean, we're going to have a lot of traffic no matter what. We know that. This is a destination for people. And uh, it's just a matter of how we can manage it, how we can keep traffic moving. Uh, Chief, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, even though we don't have the, we don't do the timing of the stoplight ourselves, we do many times with uniform officers get out there and direct traffic on and off the island when needed as well, right? So we have a good bit of control over that. We do. We have a key to the box so we can just change the lights for a period of time. We have the ability to do that. We right. do that on busy weekends and conjunction with closing 14th Avenue. Right. Okay. So that okay. we don't have to back up into the intersection on the way to go to County Park. Thank you. And and I guess the last thing for me is I, I, I this is a bigger issue for us on Isle of Palms, it seems, than it has been for other areas. For example, I know I saw a newscast a couple of nights ago where there was an interview about public safety and about the connector itself and, and even though I know that television interviews can be heavily edited it seemed like that we were really the only ones that were concerned about the issue based on the people interviewed uh, you know and I won't call out I won't call out the others other than to say that SCDOT had a portion of that interview uh, one of the advocates for cycling in the in the in the in the community which was part of that interview too so it's uh it, it's going to take i think some time and some real effort to get everybody on the same page and hopefully we can make some solid progress on this this year uh, to, to to that end um and i think you're being awful nice and maybe even too politic with uh scdot I mean, the action they did here was very aggressive and was obviously politically motivated um I would suggest uh, that the city look at hiring uh, their own traffic expert to work 
a, a plan and that can then gives us a basis for negotiating to the extent that there isn't any negotiation. I mean, they've taken away our emergency connector. That is put at risk our entire island. Police, fire, EMS cannot get on this island in the summer. Can't do it. I mean, that's just, that's just the truth. And for us to pretend that DOT is a nice group and they're going to do what they want, what, what we want them to do, I think is folly. And that we need to seriously consider in, uh, hiring our own expert to look at the situation and make recommendations as to how we can protect our citizens. Because we're not doing it right now. It's just, we're just not doing it. And I, I don't know from a procedural perspective what I need to do, but we need to hire our own expert. It's not expensive and it gives us tremendous leverage in then having meetings with DOT, Mount Pleasant, and anybody else. I, I agree with you uh, to some extent, but I'd like to add a little bit to it. Um, one of the things I've been thinking of is one of the biggest issues when we were campaigning was what? Traffic and parking. And we don't have anybody on staff that, specific, that their specific job is just that. So in terms of hiring an expert, I agree with you, we need that. Um, I believe that the city did hire someone to review what South Carolina DOT has proposed so far. And um, there's a difference between reviewing somebody else's work and actually doing the data collection analysis and coming up with a proposal to it. That's when it gets expensive. Well, but and yeah, we need to we need to know. It doesn't help us to have something that doesn't <coughs> satisfy us. And, and the data is being done. We can use SCDOT data as a matter of of then look. If we can get them to translating that data, what needs to be done, and, and we can get that data, I'm convinced. Um, but, you know, this is taking a long time. We've already gone through one season. We have incidents where what was a 10 minute ambulance ride to get from Mount Pleasant to get an ambulance on this island was 10 minutes, it takes 45 minutes in the summer when the connector is full. That people's lives are at stake and we're going to sit and just let it kind of go for a whole nother year or another season. We need to be a little bit more aggressive, in my opinion, and force something to happen. DOT in the interview that the Councilman Streetman referenced said it's just paint. Well, if it's just paint, then let's paint it back. It ain't hard. And then we from there, we can decide what needs to be done. They did it in a matter of two days. They came in here without our permission and repainted the connector to take away our emergency line. It's very simple to fix it. And if they, if they are in good faith trying to protect the citizens of this island and, their, and the visitors of this island, in two days, they could fix this. And then let's sit down and talk about long-term solutions. This is just, I'm sorry, it's outrageous in my opinion. Um, let's hear from Chief Briscoe for a minute in terms of what how emergency access has, has functioned with the new configuration on the connector. Uh, Chief, do you mind going for the mic? That way we can. Yeah. I, I'm afraid though, Madam Chair, that, that I'm not the person that should be addressing this because I got here on September the 23rd and um, my time here has been, after we sit here and talked about no off season, it's really been a slower time to where I have not ex personally experienced some of the issues that some of the battalion chiefs have expressed to me. Uh, okay. Can you on report the back at the next meeting then? I can, yes, yes ma'am. And and could bring Chief Hathaway if that's appropriate. Yeah, if, absolutely. And we can hear from Chief Cornette. I mean, yeah, we, yeah. a lot of the calls that were in um, the connector, almost all of them involved the police department. So I think we can hear from him today, today okay. on that question. But I'll be glad to bring Chief Hathaway if that's if that's permissible next time, Madam Chair. Okay, let's do that because I think this is a thorny issue. Yeah, Chief Cornette.
when they first restriped the connector, one of the things that we were concerned about was the same concern that we're talking here with emergency access to and from the island. So we had consistent meetings with DOT or conversations with their engineer. We had consistent conversations with Charleston County EMS. And we looked at our fire and police response. We did not find an incident that was solely based on the traffic on the connector that resulted in a, an extended response time uh, from anybody for an emergency situation. We did have one incident where we had a collision on the connector that blocked the entire outgoing lane to a significant event or to a significant amount that we weren't allowed any traffic to pass at that point. So we did bring up EMS on that, the opposite lane so that they could get to us even faster, but traffic was there and people do, they pull to the right, which is what they're supposed to do. Um, but we have not had any incident that we have found that we can say was based on that. One thing to look at is how Charleston County has switched the way that they put their ambulances. They don't sit stationary any longer where they used to. They used to sit closer and so they'd have that one to pull from us. They're not doing that any longer. So we may get an ambulance that's coming from a further distance than they used to come. That will put, will put a little bit of change into their response time as well. We did find some of those incidents with talking with Charleston County, uh, but nothing. I asked them specifically, have you been impacted on response time based on the connector? And they did not have any incident that they were able to tell me about. So vehicles are pulling over into the bike and pedestrian lane now to get out of the way. That's correct. Emergency vehicles. That's correct. Is that an appropriate place for us to put traffic into where there are pedestrians and bicycles when there's an emergency vehicle coming? It would obviously be safer if there was nothing on that side, but state law dictates all vehicles have to move to the furthest point of the, to the right. Uh, so that's where they should be going. And even if we had the, the center lane, which we used quite a bit, that, that one was an easy, easy way to maneuver. Uh, and we still have the ability to use those bike lanes to move people. But to answer your question, it's not the safest manner if there's somebody over there because the bicyclist or the pedestrian has to go somewhere. Uh, there's always a concern of what happens with that. We've not had an incident so far that that has impacted any of it, but that's something that's always in my mind is where, what if I pull to the right to get out of the way of an emergency vehicle and there's a cyclist here, you know, and we just, maybe we've been lucky so far and we haven't had that. And, and something that Chief mentioned that I just wanted to sort of expand upon is um, the placement of an EMS um, 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 unit. In the past, we typically have them stationed on the island for busy weekends, 4th of July. But as we, as we know, those busy weekends are becoming, are becoming more the norm, even, even those big holiday weekends. So one of our goals this year is to continue to work with them and see you know, what resources can they provide to us so that we can ensure that we have a unit on the island on site for more than just those holiday weekends um, so that we can quickly respond. And this is, not, again, something that we have been working on um, even before the changes to the connector, because before, you know, the connector was modified um, with the recent paintings, we've, we've always had traffic backup. Um, that impacts the, the EMS response or may could impact EMS response. Um, but, but from our perspective, operationally, what can we do to ensure that we have those resources closer and we're not waiting on a unit to be dispatched from North Charleston or Mount Pleasant or downtown Charleston? Um, that's to me is, is something critical that, that um, I'm putting in our, on our um, sort of to-do list um, to achieve this summer. Um, and to that point, we do typically during the summer have a Delta unit. Mm -hmm. It's not a transport unit, but it is a, a supervisor that stays here on the island. You'll typically see him around 21st. So they're kind of central on the island. Uh, and he's been a great asset to us. Now, he cannot transport somebody off the island. So that doesn't increase the ability to get somebody transported, but it does give us somebody on the island much faster. And he can't guarantee he's going to do that every weekend when he's working. I can almost guarantee he's going to try to get out here and sit here, but there's no guarantees that it's going to happen. And what, what are the capabilities of a Delta unit? He could do your basic, that's really probably better for Chief Briscoe, but my understanding is he could do your basic response first aid. He could do paramedic work and everything and hold you until the ambulance gets there to transport you. And, and stabilize. And yeah. stabilize mm -hmm. everything. 
Good. Um, this certainly is a critical matter. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's time for us to probably meet again with South Carolina DOT um, to restart the process, I think is the best way to put it, about what we're going to do with the connector and how we're going to go forward with it. Um, it's not six months, I think, is a very short time frame for that. Um, these things take time. And I also want to make sure that our community has uh, the opportunity to, to uh, input into any kind of study and proposals that are made. So it just takes time. Right. And that, which is why I would suggest reverse it, put it back the way it was next two days. And then we can talk about it. We can, we can do things. Is, is it a, for this committee, is it appropriate to make an, a motion at this point for this committee to recommend to the full council that we hire our own expert? Is that the way we do these? You, <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can make a motion um, and it'll be presented to the city council at the end of the month for, for further discussion. Okay, so we need a motion here for the three of us to agree that it go to the city council. Correct. So I, I, I would make a motion that we recommend to city council that the city hire its own expert to um, get involved in this discussion going forward concerning the connection. Um, I'll second that for the sake of discussion. Okay, um, question. There is someone that has been hired, Jennifer Beal, who is a consultant, a traffic engineering consultant here in town. And she is, a, is, is she on an on-call contract? What kind of contract do, does the city have? With it, it's project specific, it's for this project uh, on an hourly basis. Um, but they're not they're not hired to do their own art, you know, our own study, which I think is what um, right. Council Member Hahn wants to propose. Um, you know, the the they have been contracted to work with us when working with SADOT and, and, and making sure that whatever recommendations or whatever data conclusions are being are being made certainly fit the desires of this community and that all alternatives and all, um, I guess, the proper data is being looked at. Um, but it, it, I think that what I'm hearing is something different, is wanting to have our own um, study, analy data analysis, and then a development of recommendations for action that we would then take to DOT for implementation. It's not collecting our own data. That data it, it, exists, correct. but the analysis of the data and what we should and how, how things should happen because DOT has shown to us that that their their interest is not aligned with our interest. And so just overseeing what they're doing, I don't believe protects our citizens. And so my motion is only that we then bring this issue to the larger council so the larger council can consider hiring our own expert. Um, my feeling right now is that we need to define better what it is we're, we're asking for before we um, ask council to hire someone. And um, that may be a private sec work session or whatever. Um, we can't. We can't do that. I know. I, that's where I'm trying to figure out where you know. Well, you staff can have, versus uh, the, this committee can have a special meeting that the only item on the agenda is this discussion, and maybe in a more informal setting to explore that. What that what before before it goes to city council. Certainly, that's yeah. available to you all to, what, to consider. Um, the second thing is, is the timing. Um, if we're going to rely on South Carolina DOT data. I'm not sure the data we need is, is in-house there um, and finding out what it is that's necessary to do the study, what, it, what, what the outcome is that we want. And it's not just restriping the connector, it's well, the, how the, we restrike the connector, yeah, what the, alternatives we have for there it. There are different ways, obviously, yeah. to do it. And it's not as much a traffic load as it is complying with DOT's own regulations, which they currently aren't doing with the way the connector is set up complying with FEMA regulations. Uh, and none of that is, is happening right now. And none of that has to do with traffic load. It has to do with the size of the barriers on the side of the connector. They're not high enough for what DOT has done. 
we, we know it's, it's an easy thing to put up a, a, a protected bike and pedestrian lane on a bridge. We know how to do it. Go look at the Cooper River Bridge. It's, this is not hard, but we need somebody that has that expertise and that stamp to say, yeah, this, is, this would work and this is the way to do it. I am not sure from a procedural perspective how much in the weeds we're supposed to get before we push it to council. I don't know the answer to that question. Well, that's the work of the committee. So the, the, the goal would be for the committee to get a little bit into the weeds of, of defining what success looks like before you bring it before council for a recommendation. Because if not, you're gonna have, potentially have the same conversation at the council level. Um, so it would be helpful for you all to sort of streamline it and, and, and put some structure, I guess, to what be, what's being proposed. Well, then I, I, I withdraw my motion and ask that we set up a special meeting to, to discuss this in more detail so that we can craft an appropriate motion. I second that. Well, you just Should have to with, second? yeah, just with, yeah. it's your second. Yeah. You, you know, yeah, I withdraw the second. Sorry, <laughs> I got confused. We're Chair, here, we're here to help you. Yeah. We're if, I could, if I could say something here, I mean, obviously, this is a very, very high priority and, and uh, contentious issue for all of us. I mean, none of us on this island were in favor of that restriping. It was done quickly without any input from us. And I share Council Member Hans' angst about that, too. And I think it's the wrong thing to do. I think it could quickly be corrected if they would, but there just doesn't seem to be any appetite we've heard at all from SEDOT to make any changes whatsoever. I know as on council, we had a lot of discussion about an independent study. This was back in November, right? Our November meeting. At that point there, we didn't take any action on it because it felt like, I guess, as a council, that pretty much it, it was an unbudgeted expense for one thing. And then Pretty much anything, anybody that we came up with, it would be tough to find someone who, who wasn't already doing work with SEDOT, yeah. you know. And so could we get an objective opinion that way was one question. And the other big question we had, which ultimately helped us decide not to move forward, was what weight would it have with SEDOT if we did our own independent study? How would they receive it? So I think... I think if we have a special work session, that's great. I'd, I'd, I'd be all in favor of that. But I'm also wanting to know, uh, Desiree, when do we think that you all are going to have this meeting you referenced earlier that has the county, Mount Pleasant, us uh, all involved to sit down and see what we can do right away? So I, I met with the mayor yesterday to discuss that, and we were hoping to to, to schedule something for um, early to mid February. Right. So I think that's that's part of the input yeah. we need before we decide what right. we're asking for. I think um, I would like to suggest that with that other meeting that be sure to include the, the traffic department mm -hmm. in Mount Pleasant because I think they've got they're a resource that we may be able to to utilize that may be able to help us to find this better and, right. and see what our opportunities are. Because I am looking at this as a larger problem. The first one is, as Blair, you said, um, is emergency access to the island. We wanna make sure that we can safely um, serve our, our constituents. The second one is a huge traffic issue, um, which the connector is definitely you know, a big part of. Um, just as we saw when Hungry Net, when the uh, Rifle Range Road inter intersection was retimed slightly, it freed up traffic on the island. This, this was a midweek thing, so all of a sudden, you know, the, the backups went away. It's not going to be as dramatic for the weekends because the intersection is already at capacity, but we can do a better job with signal timing there that will improve traffic flow through the connector. How does that work with the, with the lane configurations we have out there? And how do, how do we want it to work in the future? And that's where I'm sort of looking at, not just what you, you're thinking of, but the next step. So we don't do the same thing twice. And so we really do need to talk about this, I think, in terms of scope and how we go about it. Um, see where we end up. Do we want to pick a date? 
Well, we, we can pick a date. We'll try to pick a date now, or that's something that you and I can come up with some dates that work for the staff and for, for you all and bounce it via email to put something on the calendar. Yeah, if, if it's agreeable to the committee, I think we should wait until after we have that meeting with the other entities to see what they're planning on doing already um, outside of South Carolina DOT, um, which what, may give us a little- meeting? Well, it so hasn't been set. set yet, but we're hoping to set it for the first to uh, first to um, the first of February to mid February. Obviously, we're going to try to get a lot of people on the same room, so coordination and availability of schedules will be um, not dependent on us necessarily. But that's our goal. And I mean, are you two willing to wait? I would rather do something sooner than that and get it teed up. So that it's so that it's there and it's staring everybody in the face. I um, mean, it's this is an urgent issue, and we got a big busy season coming up. We don't have an emergency line. I think it's easier for us to set a date to go ahead and do something for discussion and get it out there, as Council Member Pond said. It, you know, because we don't have a date certain for this other meeting, and at least to his point, we at least can uh, express the. Uh, the feelings of the committee here. Okay. Sounds we good. Can, we can do that. Um, should I, I'll just poll you afterwards or? No, I'll, I'll do, we'll handle that. Um, okay. We'll just pick a couple dates that we, um, that work for us and staff will check with um, the rest of the committee. Okay. All right, uh, any more discussion about the Allo Palms Connected? Beat that horse pretty good. Uh, it's going to get a lot more. So. All right. So on to the next new business discussion and consideration of adding more turnout gear, protective clothing for firefighters. All right. I'll tee this up for um, Chief Briscoe, but um, this was something that came to my um, to my attention by um, the chief and certainly feedback from from the department. Um, our firefighters currently have one set of turnout gear, protective clothing. Um, and the recommendation or the request is being made for the city to consider adding a second one. And I'll let Chief Briscoe, he's very much, you know, much better equipped to describe to you all the challenges of not having one and the benefits that we would have by um, increasing it. Um, it, is, it is a big ticket item. It's not something that's budgeted. So it, it would be something that we will be working through as we start working on the FY23 budget process. Um, we're looking at a, approximately $60,000 expense um, that would have to be maintained um, every, I'll let Chief Briscoe speak to how often they have to be replaced, but um, it, it is something that I support, certainly anything that our fire, uh, fire, firefighters need um, that would help them. Uh, it is Cancer Awareness for Fire Departments Month. So I think it's a very timely conversation and I just wanted to foreshadow this in something that we'll talk about more, again, as part of the budget process, but wanted to take this opportunity to bring it up, something that I support and will be recommending city council to support, hopefully you all do. Um, but then I'll, I'll, I'll just let Chief Briscoe speak to um, sort of the recommendations in terms of standards for fire departments and firefighters to have this type of um, equipment. Thank you, ma'am. I certainly appreciate that. And you were uh, very much appreciated uh, for saying those kind words. Uh, I, I don't know if you uh, had the opportunity to listen to uh, Miss, um, I think the name is Miss Julie Nessler. Uh, she was so eloquent in talking about Lavello and the, uh, the cancer uh, awareness. Uh, in my tenure here, uh, we have had one firefighter to retire. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, what I didn't mention was that that firefighter had uh, testicular cancer. And it was not the reason that he retired. But, but most of us don't die because we have a respiratory problem or old age or whatever. Most of us die from cancer or from heart attacks. And no reflection on the previous administration or, or any administrations uh, 
with the fire department, but but we are lacking. If you go over there right now and look in the protective clothing room that we keep, it's, it's slim to none. And we've just hired two. Uh, the first one came to work last week and the second one comes to work the 18th of January. And that will fill us up. The, the young man that came to work last week is having to wear leftovers from somebody else. And as children, we all grew up a lot of times wearing leftovers. But regardless, I don't have anything to put the next firefighter in that comes on duty on the 18th. Now, it was budgeted for protective clothing, but the National Fire Protection Association says that, that turnout gear, protective clothing, should be replaced every 10 years, whether it's used or not, because it's exposed to the elements, the lighting, whatever, that, that it should be replaced every 10 years. So that's a challenge for the city of Isle of that, that, that is a challenge. We have 30, 33 paid career firefighters. So every 10 years, you can see how that's going to cost. Now, why we need two sets? Uh, I was surprised first when I arrived to find out that we don't have two sets. And the reason being is if, if I go to Councilman Hahn's house and then I go to your house, Madam Chair, you don't want me having the same contaminants brought from whatever the incident was at Councilman Hahn's house to, to be brought to your house to add to whatever's going on there. Plus, if, if I do have a firefighter that's exposed to elements or fires or chemicals or hazmat, then it is recommended by the National Fire Protection Association that I, I take those protective clothing and have it decontaminated right then, which the city of Isle of Palms has an extractor on site at, at headquarters or station one, which we can de decontaminate. But what does he or she wear while his protective clothing is being decontaminated. They're having to use somebody else's. So that that's why, it, it, and I promise you I'm a little slow <laughs> in my old age, but like Ms. Fergoso, I'm very thorough in, in our investigation on why we need this. That's why people have asked, well, why don't you get it sooner? Why don't, why don't you bring it to us, you know, in November or October? You know, you got here in September. Well, that's true, but but we want to look at what's best for the city, what's best for our employees, the people that are protecting our, our citizens here on the island. So our, our presentation is if we could increase, if I could ask you for 15 sets. Now, as Ms. Fergoso says, that's going to be around $50,000 or more for 15 sets of protective clothing. This does a couple things. Yes, sir, Mr. Tom. I see on the second item that we have, right after this one, is disposing of an uh, engine and a jet ski. Yes, have correct. You, you got any idea what that value is? Uh, yes, sir. The, um, the engine 1002 has been estimated at 25. Now, it's okay. gone up. It was estimated at around 14 or 18. And this was uh, when we were in negotiations a while back. Uh, everything has gone up, getting, but but they estimate that we could possibly, if you can find a buyer, you could possibly get twenty five for it. The jet skis around five thousand. So roughly half of what you're asking for for protective equipment could be offset by the sale of the surplus. That's where I was. Could yes, sir. Could if you could if you could get twenty five out of the truck. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir, you, you are correct. Chief, uh, could I ask a question? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Sir. Is there any kind of grant opportunity for this? Yes, sir, there is. The AFG grant, Assistance to Fire Grant, that's with the federal government. It, it closes this month. Uh, it will, uh, I, I have applied and received that grant before. Um, it is, it, it's 
difficult, but not impossible. I don't think that we have time with this purchase to put our stuff together, but I would entertain, it is a matching grant that we look at that for our next purchase because this 15 sets just bring would bring us up to even. So we'd be looking at outlaying expense right away to go ahead and outfit our department. Correct. We could, but we could follow up with another grant, a matching grant opportunity. Exactly. Going into next year to kind of Exactly. All because it, if if I would if I could ask, I would ask for 33 sets next year. So then I would encourage the city to to go after the AFG grant for the remainder of the 33 sets. Yes. Why, why not ask year. for 33 sets this year? Because <laughs> we can't apply for the I, 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 I can't. <laughs> I, I can't apply for the grant. You're you're no, exactly I, right, Madam I, I, Chair. I'm being a little facetious. But I but I would love to ask for 33 sets from you right now. But money wise, and and I, I don't want to be greedy, and, and I I don't want us to seem uh, just frivolous with the with the city's money. That that we are, and, and I know you're joking, but no, but well, but because I really did, I wanted to ask. Matter of fact, I sent Miss Fergoso an email that said, I'm, "I got to have 15, but I'll take 33." Right, right. Well, I, but I want to qualify that it wasn't really a joke, joke, but it was yeah. one of those tongue-in-cheek sort of things. Yes, sir. But, yes. Sir. But where I'm coming from is, I mean, I think that the the work your department does, all of our public safety department. Is outstanding and you, uh, could, could always improve in some areas. Oh, whatever. sure. But to, yes. it seems to me that really a high priority for us, one of our highest priorities, is taking care of the people that protect us. I agree. Sir. And, uh, you know, if it, for me as a council member, if it, if it, if, if a request comes and said we need to have everybody with, a, with an additional outfit, I could, you could probably sell me on that. Yes. You know? sir. I mean, I don't know how much money we're talking about. They're about um, four thousand a piece, so uh, thirty-three would be we're looking so at probably a hundred and thirty or forty thousand. Correct. Correct. You know, offset a little bit by some of this surplus property we're going to we're going to talk about in a little bit. Plus, we might have a grant opportunity, a matching grant opportunity next year with the AFG grant. You know, yes. it's like, you know, some things, even if they're not budgeted, it's the right thing to do. So. Um, Chief, just to yes, clarify, um, the protective clothing is in addition to the turnout gear you're asking for. Right? No, ma'am. Different. The terminology is different depending on the firefighter and the section of the country you're in. Some yeah. people call it protective clothing. Some call it turnout gear. Uh, in Charleston, they call it bodyguard. Uh, it, 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 it's all the same thing. So yes, all you're asking for is protective 15 clothing. Sets. Yes, ma'am. 15 sets of protective clothing. Now that includes a helmet, a pair of gloves, a flashover hood, we call it, that they, they wear to, to keep them protected, and their coat and pants and their boots. That's, that's considered a full, full complement of protective clothing or turnout gear or bodyguard. And how much do we spend on capital expenditures equipment for the firefighters annually? May I answer that, Mr. Ferguson? Sure. Okay, what, what has been done in the past, and it's great, is you, the council has, a, or we have agreed on our, our budget to, to have five additional sets of protective clothing purchased each year. My recommendation to the next chief and to Ms. Fergoso is to go 10 sets because we're not even staying even. It's, it's like payroll, you know, like our wage study we just did. That, 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 you know, you find out, hey, I'm not even even here. So it, it's been determined and the risk analysis has been done. If we can get this 15 purchased, if we can get the grant and purchase everybody two sets, then the ideal would be to have 10 sets each year going starting in 2023 and from there on. And if we start in 2022, you'll not get any arguments. <laughs> I guess what I'm asking is being new to the budget process, if it's an additional cost that's above and beyond, you know, if it's 
a high expense year for buying a new uh, truck or something like that, uh, then maybe this would not be the year to do it. If we're not, if it's just a normal or uh, uh, budget year with respect to equipment that you need, then this certainly is a high priority item. Uh, yeah, and what, 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 we can, what we can do is, um, and we're actually starting the FY23 budget process, which begins with a review of capital and capital uh, purchases of FY22 and what's been completed and what would need to be deferred. If there are any items that could be deferred that may not be as higher a priority, we can do that and then use budgeted funds towards this purchase in FY22 with the combination of maybe, um, you know, the surplus property could be sold um, if we're successful there to, um, again, use some of that money to, to um, be able to purchase at least the first of 15. So that should be that should be the motion that we make to to take to council to discuss a minimum of fifteen sets of protective clothing. Correct. It would be an out of budget expenditure. However, um, you're assigning staff to find ways to offset that expense by either deferring other things or finding um, uh, uh, items that could be sold, just like what we're talking about later, to um, to make up the difference. And also during that discussion that we'll have in ways and means, I guess, and then yes, later sir. on council would be, do, do we go all in? I mean, do we, did we fully outfit the, the 33? So that would all be part of the discussion too. I vote for that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you best friend. <laughs> yes, sir, you are. <laughs> Well, we can, yeah, you all may entertain a, a, a motion that will be presented to Ways and Means next week, and we'll. Make a motion. I, okay, let me get this right. I will make a motion that we uh, recommend to, full, to Ways and Means to add more turnout gear to protective clothing for firefighters. 15. 15, 15 sets. Well, that I could be, you, I think seven. you want to leave it general oh, so that you can yeah. have a conversation. Oh, okay. So we, can have it. Okay. When we have a discussion, we will be saying minimum 15. Well, not less than. Motion, nope. not yeah, less maybe. than 15. Yeah. If we need to add that, we can add that based on uh, part of a friendly, friendly amendment. Friendly amendment. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Add that right. as a friendly amendment. So Second. we'll get Robert's rules down one of these. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll be there to place the. So that's yeah, the motion. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All in well, favor? Well, I, I, I certainly support this because I don't think we have that it that we can send any of our firefighters or policemen, for that matter, into harm's way without proper equipment. Yeah. Period. Thank you. And sir. it's no different than having an emergency plane on the connector. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to decide this faster. <laughs> I'm going to agree, so. Any other discussion? <laughs> Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Would you like for me to stay here, ma'am? For... I think we, um, you, you certainly may. Um... All right. It's the discussion and consideration of the surplus property. Well, now we know what we're going to do with this. <laughs> so this should be quick. Well, I, I hate to break, beg for money and then, and then bring you bad news, but again, <laughs> Uh, and and if it's okay to speak freely, uh, I, I may if 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 I was if I was going to sell this fire truck, I would put a time frame on there. If I was going to ask twenty five thousand dollars for it, if it is not sold within a month, maybe that it comes back to this committee for further recommendations. The jet ski, I, I don't think you have any problem with. Uh, we have not in the past, whether it be Isle of Palms or Oak Island or wherever, we have not had problems moving that type of equipment, the jet mm -hmm. ski or ski do. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the, the reason this is on the agenda is according to our procurement code, I can authorize the donation of any surplus property um, if it's valued at $10,000 or less. The engine is valued at 20, like uh, Chief Gresco said, twenty four, twenty five thousand dollars. Um, there are opportunities 
to donate this equipment to uh, a neighboring uh, or a community that is in need of it. Um, we're not talking about a municipality, but if that if we are not able to sell it for that amount and you all wanna consider something else to do, it would be a, a, a good community effort um, to, to donate it, um, but it would require you all's approval. So just giving you a kind of foreshadowing it um, that we have, I know the fire department has some folks in mind that may, um, would be well, um, will benefit them significantly um, to have this type of equipment. So I think that I, I agree with you, Frisco, if we're not able to sell the truck um, and use those proceeds towards the purchase of the uh, protective clothing, then we, it, it's going to come back to you all for a decision of what we do, what we can do next. And that would be like, uh, giving it away to a small volunteer fire department in a community sort of setting. Correct. That we run mutual aid with, that runs mutual aid with us. Okay. So, so that's an no, option. Don't let that influence you. <laughs> that is an option, but we, we, you, we don't need to take any, you all don't need no. to take any okay. action. I was, I was gonna say, so what do we do about that? No, 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 um, again, just foreshadowing um, that that's something that we're gonna have to make a decision on if we're not able to sell it. So we're authorizing the sale of the equipment at this point? Um, you don't need to take any action. We'll sell it. If we are going to donate it, then because of the expense, because of the value, I'm sorry, um, you all would need to approve that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on. Miscellaneous business. Our next meeting is 10 a.m. Thursday, February 3rd. Um, is there any other business? that we need to discuss. Maybe no, the, so we're, we're talking about having um, a special meeting between now and February 3rd. Yes, ma'am. Okay, just to discuss the Outer Palms Connector. Motion to adjourn. Second.